I'm Pastor Tom, and welcome to the Sunday you Sermon. You got to move. You got, you got to move. move. You got to move. You got to move. You got to move, child. You got to move. You got to move. Because when the Lord gets ready. I'm going to read to you now from Genesis chapter 39, literally picking up where we left off last week. So this is Genesis 39, verses 20 through 23. So Potiphar threw Joseph in jail into the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and that's where Joseph remained. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail, so that whatever was done within the jail, Joseph became responsible for it all. As a result, the chief jailer did not need to supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him so that whatever Joseph did, the Lord made it prosper. So just a reminder of how this story goes. You have Joseph who uh, starts, when we first meet Joseph, he's 17. He's idealistic, as 17-year-olds often are. He's got a kind of a positive attitude. He thinks there's a right way to do stuff, and it should be done the right way, which gets him into trouble. First, when he tattles on his brothers who are not doing it the right way. And, uh, uh, and then he, he has some dreams, and he tells his brothers about the dreams, even though, to be honest, he probably should have kept them to himself. And as a result, he didn't judge the character of his brothers very well. They were a lot older than him, and two of them are bloodthirsty maniacs, the truly psychotic pair, Simon and Levi. So uh, there was, yeah, it did not, go, did not turn out well for Joseph. He ends up not being killed, but uh, being enslaved, taken, uh, kidnapped, literally, uh, and hauled off to Egypt where he is sold in the slave market. But he ends up working for a guy named Potiphar, who is an important man in the, in the government. Potiphar is like the cap a captain in the king's guard. So he's got a pretty substantial household. He's got fields and property and a house and um, servants and family. And Joseph is just really, he's like, yeah, he, I will do my best for my master. So he does. He does really well. He does good work. He's a competent person. And God has a plan, so God is blessing the work. So not only does Joseph do it well, but it turns out well. Sometimes you can do good work and it doesn't turn out well for reasons that are outside of your control. But it's like the winds are in his favor. So he, he becomes very important in Potiphar's household. He becomes the head of Potiphar's household, literally the major domo of the, of the entire thing. The whole estate is under his control. And, and he believes that he's made it. I mean, I, I'm sure when he got to that point, he's like, okay, God has blessed me. I'm good. And then he becomes the victim of what nowadays we would look at and describe as um, workplace sexual harassment. And he tries to do what is right and ends up suffering the consequences, getting fired. Now, the fact that he ends in jail rather than dead pretty much demonstrates the fact that Potiphar wasn't entirely convinced of the story that was being told to him by uh, his wife. But you got to save face, you know, you got to make, you got to do the appearance thing. It's got to look right. But the jail he throws him in is not just a common jail. This is the jail where the king's prisoners are kept. So this is all the, these are, this is high class jail. I, I, I wouldn't know, I don't think you would, you might describe it as, what do they call it, club fed? You know, the white collar crime jail where it's pretty easy going. I am not certain about that, but it's definitely not the worst possible jail to be in. So that says something about what Potiphar thinks of what had happened, and maybe how he feels about Joseph personally. Uh, and Joseph now finds himself there, stuck there. We don't know how long he's there, but he's, he must be, it must be a while. Clearly, Joseph is no longer 17. He had to have been in the household of Potiphar for some years in order for him to keep rising up through the ranks to become the major domo. 
and now he's, he's in this jail and he's gonna be here a while too. So I, I, wanna, I wanna suggest something. The, the text doesn't, it just glosses over the details, jumps right to the ending. But you gotta, you gotta figure, when he first gets thrown into jail, he's not feeling very happy. Joseph is not like, oh good, another great adventure. <laughs> you know, there's, it's certainly not the case. He's got to be thinking to himself, what is going on here? I was just trying to do what was right. What's wrong? And he's thinking through his head all the things he should have said or done differently than he did. If only this, if only that. I should have said this. I should have. How many times did his brain recycle the events that landed him in jail, thinking over and over again about it, thinking about what he should have said, how he could have done it differently, all of that stuff just cycling through. And you know he had to have a pity party because sometimes you have to have a pity party. You just do. Everything's falling apart, and you just got to feel bad. Now, I know that is not our way, because we are Minnesotans. I have talked to many Minnesotans, and as it turns out, Wisconsinites too, same thing. And they can be like just suffering terrible things happening, you know, just people in the worst conditions, everything's going wrong, and they'll say, after they tell me about what's going wrong, they'll say, well, it could be worse. It could be worse. I've seen people, other people have it worse. I shouldn't feel bad because other people have it worse. And, and I have to say to folks under those circumstances, I have to say, yeah, yeah, maybe there are other people who have it worse, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't feel bad because it kind of sucks for you. It's bad. You're in a really crummy situation. It's okay to feel bad when everything falls apart. It's okay to feel bad when it all goes wrong. It's okay to feel bad when, when you know, something happens that, wrecks up our health or something happens where we lose a loved one or, or something happens and we lose a job. It's okay to feel bad. I mean, the scripture is full of people crying out to God from their depths. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Hear my voice. You know, like, how long, O God, will you ignore me forever? I'm just kind of randomly quoting from the Psalms. But it's, there's the, it's okay. It's okay. But at some point, you got to deal with the situation that you're in, the circumstances that you can't change or control. One of the, uh, one of the oldest, one of the first lessons in Genesis as a straight up instruction is something God says to Cain. So you remember the story of Cain and Abel. They both bring an offering. Abel brings a really good offering. He brings the best, the first fruits of his flock. Cain brings an offering that he's just trying to get by. Like, what is the minimum offering I can give the Lord and just, you know, be okay? And God is pleased with Abel's offering, but not really with Cain's. And Cain is upset about this, you know, teacher's pet, right? How come you like him better than me? And God's answer to Cain is very, very straightforward. He says, if you do well, won't it be better for you? Right? I mean, this is a fundamental truth. If you, if you do well, it'll be better. That's not a promise it'll be perfect or wonderful or something, but it will be better. So, for example, if we do better with our finances, our financial situation will improve or you get a better credit score. If you, if you do some exercise, you know, it doesn't mean you turn into Arnold Schwarzenegger, but it means that you'll be healthier. If you eat better, you'll be healthier. If you do better, just whatever it is, if you just do better, it will turn out better. Do, do well, it'll turn out better. This is such a fundamental rule of life. This is the rule of life. So here's Joseph in the midst of a place in circumstances he has literally no control over. And so what does he do? He decides to do the best he can with what he's got. He decides to follow that piece of advice. And then he works hard and diligently and whatever he's given to do, he tries to do it well. And you have to understand this, he's, the wind is at his back. Now, I got to say something about that because we have a tendency to think, well, how come, you know, that guy got to be rich and famous and I didn't? Certainly, you can't say that they're working harder than me. No, but there's, there are situations that we don't control. 
If you haven't happened to be the right person in the right place at the right time and you do well, then you will end up being Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, Bill Gates, right? They all, they knew each other. They all were in the same schools together. They all had access to the computers at, at the same key time in the development of computer science so that they were all right there when that whole thing was happening. That's why they were able to step up. But how many other people were there too? How many other classmates didn't succeed like they did? Who just looked for an okay job somewhere because they had that background. Oh, this company's got a big computer. The, well, they're gonna need me. As opposed to what a handful of people did. Or how about, like, I mean, our, our whole way of shopping is so different nowadays, right? Amazon? And everyone is in the online shopping business right now. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, JCPenney's or Walmart. They all have their online shopping division. But no one can compete with Amazon. Amazon is at a whole other level. Why? Because Bezos was a better business person? No. I'm not saying he wasn't a good business person, but he was just in the right place at the right time and claimed it. Right? He starts out with, the, with books. Amazon was originally just books and DVDs and uh, CDs, that's all it was. But he managed to literally put bookstores out of business. I watched it happen, <laughs> right? And then he just expanded. The only, the only other online retailer that can compete with Bezos, with Amazon, is Alibaba, and that's in China, and that's because there's no Amazon in China. That's it. Right person, right place, right time. There were circumstances that favored the hard work that he did. You and I, we may work really, really hard, do really, really well, and there's no promise that I, I can pretty much guarantee that none of us will get the Nobel Prize, that none of us will have a beautiful um, uh, white and black charcoal drawing of our face appearing on the cover of, of Newsweek or Time Magazine or something. Uh, I will never be anybody's person of the year. <laughs> Well, maybe my dogs, but uh, that's, no, not even there. That's my wife. So, possibly my, my father-in-law, he might be the one. But, but I mean, it's because the, this is not the timing and the circumstance, but that doesn't mean that the rule doesn't still apply. There were, when, when Amazon started, there were a lot of people who had access to the same things. They just didn't do it. Bezos did. The result is he's the one who succeeded. Everyone else can do well. They can enter into that online commerce world, and they can do okay, and they can do well, and, and it will be better for them. But, you know, it's, you can't measure your success by someone else's success. Just understand the rule is, is if you do well, it will be better. In Joseph's case, he's the right guy in the right place at the right time. So his doing better has a bigger Result that we can all look at and go, man, was he lucky. But there could have been a different solution. He could have been moping around and doing the least he possibly could because, doggone it, this is not fair. God is being mean to me, and now here I am stuck in this place. He could have done that. I have known people to do that, to decide that everything is not their fault. All this bad stuff happens. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. I have, I, okay, I have to be really careful how I say this because I, I almost said, I've been in prison with people, but I don't really mean, what I mean is <laughs> I have been in the jails, in the prisons, visiting people who are incarcerated. Okay, let's be very clear about that. And I've heard the stories that they say. I've heard them talk about how, well, what I did, like that other guy did something way worse, and, and he only got six months, and I got a year and a half. And I've heard all of this, well, it's not my fault. They, you know, it's not my fault. They made me mad, or you should have seen how, what, what they said to me. I, I couldn't let that go. I mean, there's all these stories about this, and I see this out in the world as well. People who, their situation is terrible, and they, when you try to create the opportunity for them to do better so things will go well, you know, find which way the wind is going so they can lift up their sails and, and get moved forward, that doesn't always work. I actually was dealing with a guy once, um, He'd come in for help, and his story, he was married, had some kids, there was some significant health issues 
I think it was his wife, he had, so he often had to take her to the doctors. So he wanted to work, he told me, but um, so the first thing I did was there were guys working on the roof of the church. I checked with them. Uh, hey, guys, do you need additional workers? They're like, yeah, sure. So I came back and I said, well, you could work on the roof of the church. They say that they could use some workers. He's like, oh, I'm, I, heights. I'm afraid of heights. Plus, I have to be around during the day to take my wife to medical appointments. I'm like, so you need like a second or third shift job. Yeah, that's it. So I found him one. I did. Now, it wasn't, so I have to be careful how I put this. It wasn't a nice job, but it was a good job, okay? It was, you know, when you go to the store and you buy, um, like, frozen chicken breasts in the freezer section or breaded chicken breasts from the freezer section, there's a couple of companies that make that. And it was at one of these companies, at their plant. And, and the job was, see, you're, you're working chicken all day, but at the end of the day, there's a crew of people who have to come in and they have to clean up, they, they have to especially clean all of the equipment because this is processing food. So you gotta clean it out, make sure there's no, it's disinfected and so it's a wet, messy, important, but not easy job. But it paid pretty good because it was a night shift job. It started like at 10 o'clock at night. So it paid well. In fact, 10 o'clock at night, that means you're getting off about six. So that works out. If you've got kids, you got to get to school. This is like perfect. Pa paid well. You only had to work like two months. I believe it was work two months and you had to have full benefits. Two months. Health insurance. And I'm like, this is great. So I, I was talking with him about that. I told him where it was and what, he, you know, and that this job's available. You just have to go. And um, how will I get there? Well, it's summer, you can bike for now. And once you've worked long enough, you'll be able to buy maybe another car if that's what you need or whatever. Um, but there you go. And I told him though, I said, listen, you have to be clear about something. During that first period of time before the benefits kick in, you have literally no, you don't have sick days, you don't have anything. You cannot miss a day of work. Because if you miss a day at work, they're just gonna be like, clearly not a reliable worker, and they'll go find someone else. So do not miss any work. I didn't hear anything for a, a while. So after a week or two or three, I just called over to the plant. I talked to the same guy I talked to who was their HR guy, and I learned, oh, he showed up for two shifts and we never saw him after that. I later learned that he blamed me. <laughs> it wasn't his fault, it was my fault. It's always someone else's fault. It's always someone else. Someone else is to blame. Someone else is, is the one who's out there. It's always somebody else. It's like never hearing that message. You know, if you do well, it'll be better for you. No, it's, I'm not supposed to be the one that does well. It's supposed to just happen towards me. It's supposed to just come my way. If you do better, no. Somebody else has to do better so I can enjoy it. That attitude is out there. There's a world of people who think that. Now, by the way, here's an example of a guy who was on the, on the dark end of the economy, but uh, you see it on the other end too. I mean, there are very rich people who are rich because they inherited their money, which means they're sure that they deserved and i.e. earned their money, which of course they didn't. And then when things go bad, it's not their fault. It's, I mean, everyone else does business that way. What we're doing wasn't that bad. There was no crime. It's not our, it was a, they were prosecuting me. That was an unjust prosecution. You just hear that story. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, you can have that same attitude. It's just if you're rich, you have more resources when you complain about how it's not your fault. Or you can be like Joseph, who's got circumstances that are outside of his control, opportunities that he himself did not create, and a choice about whether or not he would do well or not do well. And he chooses to do well. And he finds that the winds of God's grace are blowing his way. That God intends to be 
deeply faithful towards Joseph because God intends to be deeply faithful beyond Joseph. And Joseph just has to tack the wind a little. He's still got to, he's still got to step up. He can't just go, okay, Lot, make it happen. And so he does. Now, he has no idea what God has in mind. He has no vision of getting out of prison. He doesn't know where he's going to end up. We do. We know this story. He has no idea what's coming. As far as he knows, this prison he's in is where he's going to spend the rest of his life. But he makes a choice about what kind of life he wants to spend, what kind of life he wants to live, and what kind of person he wants to be. And then he acts accordingly. He acts with faithfulness. He acts in grace. He tries to be honorable. He tries to do the right thing. He just steps out and lives that way. He decides that regardless of his circumstances, he wants to be the kind of person who is better. In fact, I don't know if you've heard this. It's sort of a variation on if you, if you do well, want to be better for you. It's this. If you want your life to be different, live your life differently. When I tell people this, they should go, well, what should I do different? I don't know. Turns out if you change anything, it will change your life. If you change a small thing, it will change your life a little. If you change a big thing, it will change your life a lot. But if you change anything in how you live your life, your life will be different. It just will. That's how it works. That's the equation. And Joseph, whether he ever was told this before, he seems to have understood it. And when he acted in faithfulness, it turns out that God was faithful and God was blessing him and he prospered and he did well within the limited narrow world in which he was, he prospered and he achieves basically the same status in the prison that he had in the house of Potiphar. He becomes the number two guy. And hopefully in the process, he learned a lesson, which is you are still an outsider. Don't take it for granted and understand your circumstances might change at any time, but live well, do well. It will be better. Can you find now the prayer of response? And we'll pray that together. Merciful God, I find comfort sometimes lamenting the injustice of my situation. Why do these things happen to me, I cry. Why don't the good things come my way? God, it's just not fair. If you are loving and kind, that you should fix my situation and rescue me from my circumstances. I'm the injured party, the oppressed soul, the beleaguered innocent. But after I have wallowed long enough, I must choose how I will live within and despite my circumstances. So help me choose a path of faithfulness, honor, and love, and not the path of helpless pity and hapless victimhood. In Jesus' name, amen. We'd love to have you join us for in-person worship Sunday morning at 8.30 at Christ United Methodist, or Sunday morning at 1015 at Stanton United Methodist. And if Sunday morning is not your jam, join us Monday night, six o'clock at Christ United Methodist for Pizza Church. It's church, and then we eat pizza. Until next time, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the face of the Almighty be upon you. And may God grant you peace. Mm -hmm.